Oh, hello. Um, I'm uh, Matt Town. Uh, Prit- yeah. yeah. <laughs> hello. I'm Matt Town, principal archaeologist at Stantec. Uh, my colleague Tommy Jew, um, and he's a senior archaeology and heritage consultant. Um, we're going to give you um, a quick overview of um, the work that Stantec's been doing within the water industry in the UK. Um, how the infrastructure related to the water industry is developing, and um, also the impacts that this can have on archaeology and heritage. Sorry, that one there. Uh, this slide shows some of the main water companies that Stantec works with. Um, myself, I work mainly with um, Northumbrian Water and Yorkshire Water, and Tommy works quite a lot with Anglian Water. Um, but we have we work within sort of frameworks across across the UK. And our Reading office deals with companies in Southern Water, South Western, and so on. We also work across in Ireland as well. So we we have quite a quite a wide um, uh, national uh, reach. Uh, my colleague Tommy will cover the um, the freshwater side um, around reservoirs and clean drinking water and the challenges around that. And I will cover the uh, the other end, um, which is the uh, the dirty water and the sewage, um, and the responses to um, sewage pollution and spillages in particular. Sorry, I can't do two things at once. Um, I think it's worth having a quick, uh, very quick one minute uh, discussion about the uh, the water industry and how it's developed, um, because it has direct relevance to the issues that we face today um, within um, within the UK. Obviously, during the 19th century, um, the UK faced fairly significant challenges related to water su- su- uh, supply and sanitation. There was a rapid urbanization, the back of uh, the Industrial Revolution, um, which led to overcrowded cities, inadequate sewage systems, and contaminated water sources. And also, waterborne diseases like cholera were rampant, um, causing widespread suffering and mortality. Recognising the urgency, local authorities began constructing waterworks and sewage systems to improve their public health. In the uh, mid-1800s, uh, visionary engineers like Joseph Bazalgette and Thomas Hoxley uh, pioneered innovative solutions like uh, Bazalgette's Grand Sewer Network in London, to significantly reduce uh, disease outbreaks, and Hawksley's water supply schemes um, ensured clean water for growing populations. Municipal waterworks emerged across the country and uh, supplying pipe water to homes and businesses from custom-made reservoirs, in our case, high up in the Dales. The next major change was really after World War II, when the UK nationalised its water industry, and the Water Act of 1945 established regional water boards responsible for water supply and sewage treatment. These boards invested in infrastructure, reservoirs and treatment plants. By the 1970s, the water quality had improved, but the ageing infrastructure meant uh, that this was a very expensive problem. So in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher very kindly uh, uh, privatised the uh, industry and created the, um, the water companies that we, that we now have. So despite this apparent investment, um, the recent decades have seen water companies struggle with the twin demands of water supply and uh, sewage disposal. Why is this happening? Well, we have an ageing infrastructure. The systems built in the 19th century are quite often still operational in the 21st century without any overhaul. Uh, I record one of the first jobs I ever did for Stantec was recording this headstock in um, in a cold crack reservoir, um, which was for opening the valves um, in the reservoir, and it dated to 1889 and never been replaced. Um, and uh, it just goes to show that um, there is there is still a lot still to be um, to be done in terms of improving the uh, um, the the infrastructure. Um, population increases are a key thing, and we've got antiquated systems designed for smaller populations, which would which have now quadrupled in some urban areas um, since the establishment of the water network. We've got increase of um, hard surfacing on development sites and in previous green spaces, less opportunity for water to drain. Climate change got increased uh, rainfall, overwhelming systems from milder, wetter winters and hotter summers making the ground, um, baking the ground, which means the water is unable to permeate um, and increased flash flooding and extreme weather events. In recent decades, the water industry has shifted towards a model of sustainability and environmental stewardship. And companies do now investigate in leak reduction, water conservation, and carbon reduction, all of which have impacts on archaeology. So obviously, we work within the planning industry, and um, MPPF covers developments requiring planning permission. Quite a lot of these schemes that we see, such as wetlands, 
do require planning. But what about those with permitted development rights? And um, Joe and Emily have very um, eloquently covered um, the, the fact that permitted development rights are, um, it's important to get early engagement with, with the clients and encourage engagement with wider stakeholders, such as Historic England or um, County Archaeology, in order to discuss potential impacts and um, get ahead of where there may be um, problems with archaeology and heritage, certainly at the sort of auctioneering stage of some of these schemes. So essentially, consultation is the key, and it's important to get that in place early. So my colleague Tommy is now going to have a look at um, the fresh warp schemes. So I'll just pass it over to him. So, uh, yeah, I'll be covering the freshwater stuff. Um, we'll do a bit of a whistle stop tour. So, we'll start off with reservoirs. So, there was a 2023 update to the Reservoirs Act, which was originally brought out in 1975, which lowers the minimum size of the, of the reservoir. So, a bit of a side effect is this is that many smaller lakes across the country are now classed as reservoirs and come under the protections that are required for that. Um, so, many ornamental lakes, some good examples from National Trust properties over the country there um, are now under its protection, which means that we have to do some basically works to stop seepage and that sort of thing from it. So this comes with heritage constraints. A lot of them are in registered parks and gardens. Um, and the National Trust are actually doing a really good job to get ahead of this. Um, and they've started work on a lot of their reservoirs to get these consents and get this work done before the changes come into effect. Um, so for a quick example here, it's not a National Trust job, um, but Stantec worked on a desk-based assessment and some site work um, for Grasshome. And uh, the trial trenching that followed involved the excavation of a um, borrow pit and, uh, sorry, lost myself, and a strip back and record. Um, these revealed some late Bronze Age settlements and a funerary complex, um, a stone-built ring cairn, um, which would have had a primary kist inhumation burial. Uh, in the center and then further worked flints were recovered from the feature um there's also a second large structure built with a stone skin and turf car walls um, flagstone interior floor which is thought to be a roundhouse and field walls or reeves on the slopes forming part of a sub rectangular enclosure um, so it's essentially a farm and a church in simple terms a further area to the northeast of the structures was needed to create a laydown area um, and this included several pits with finds including fire affected stones, chap orange fills, and various types of handmade pottery. Um, these sorts of remains indicate late prehistoric domestic activity. So that was a really good project that we got to work on. Um, moving on to canals. Is that gone? Canals. Um, they're a key component in our sort of country's identity. They were vital for our rise to being an industrial superpower. Um, there's over 4,000 miles of canal across the UK. Um, good example being Birmingham, which has more miles of canals than Amsterdam or Venice. Um, you can see the canals in orange on that map there. Um, they're key aspects of our landscape. And while they're no longer used for industry, they're big sort of community areas, um, great for walking dogs on and the like. Um, rewilding in canals doesn't tend to involve major physical changes and it's mainly achieved through sort of vegetation insulation and management on those sides of things. Um, our other waterways ways are a little bit different. Um, the rewilding of smaller waterways can involve quite stark physical changes. If you've got the, on the left there's the, the uh, stage zero cellworthy floodplain restoration. Um, which involved basically creating new waterways and making them as natural looking as possible. Um, a lot of these waterways are intrinsically tied to our history though. So mill streams are a great example of this. And a lot of them were canalised and straightened during the post-medieval period. Um, and they're a key aspect of the setting of sort of a mill dominated landscape. So this brings us on to the eventually on to re-wiggling, um, which is a term coined by the London Mayor Sadiq Khan in 2022. So there's a great example of this on the left, the Swindale Beck. And you can see how it was manually sort of re-wiggled um, to 
essentially each flood risks. Um, so it involves this restoring the natural looking bends back to a water bay, waterway, um, which has been straightened in the past. So this can also involve enabling rivers to spill out across ancient floodplains to restore surrounding wetlands. This eases flooding downstream, improves water quality and boosts biodiversity, um, with a successful example of this being the rewilding of the River Otter, which is currently ongoing, which aims to create 55 hectares of biodiversity um, estuary habitat. The scheme introduces areas of salt marsh, mudflats, reed beds, woodland and scrub, while also adding experiential value for the visitors to the site. This does present some heritage issues though, surrounding assessment and mitigation, mainly because there's no easy way to characterise the before which rewilding seeks, seeks to replicate. Our landscape's ever-changing and that character of the change is very important um, through thousands of years of human occupation. So a couple of thinking points on that. Um, so landscape is a palimpsest which is something reused or altered, but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form. So our thinking points are essentially, at what point does restoration stop creating a positive effect from a heritage perspective? How can we tailor our heritage assessments to address this when we're completing rewilding schemes? And how can we account for the subsurface changes that might come along with this and changes to our water table? So uh, I'll pass back over to Matt now to finish. So, that's all right. Missed that one. Um, just going to finish off on the consequ consequences of sewage spills. Um, it's always a bad, bad news day for the water companies at the moment. Um, as you know, there's um, there's a lot of uh, sewage pollution, and it's in the news all the time. Very high profile news stories like the boat race. Um, the uh, there was a triathlon in Sunderland where 57 swimmers got ill from swimming in the sea. Um, it's fairly regular occurrence, and I think only a few days ago, Steve Backshaw was on the news. Um, showing um, lethal levels of E. coli near his house. So it's uh, yet to recall. So why is this happening? I'm going to cover this really quickly because I know we're out of time. But um, the, 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 the sewer system is, is based on a, a network of uh, combined sewers and basically they take clean rainwater and wastewater through the same pipe to the sewage treatment works. And the problem is that during um, high, high levels of rainfall and flooding, these overflow. It's a safety mechanism. It's designed to allow the water to spill out so that it doesn't back up into people's houses uh, and cause issues. But obviously, there are an awful lot of CSOs within the, um, with the, within the UK. There are 22,000 in the UK and 14,000 in England alone. And over 700 of these were identified by the Environment Agency for further investigation. These are the direct causes of the sewage spillages. So the water companies are aware of this and are, dealing, are looking at ways to deal with the, the problems. Um, and they have a number of different um, uh, uh, different solutions, which are all which all have um, archaeological and heritage implications. So, in urban areas, you get uh, surface water collection. So, these are taken across. Uh, these are basically to minimise overloading the sewer system. So, you get bioretention, soakways, attenuation tanks, and green corridors back to rivers. You get improvements in CSOs, which is the top um, right which is the building of large tanks yes, I know. Um, <laughs> uh, in order to take uh, in order to take uh, stormwater and then pump it back into the network once the um, once the, um, the surges are finished. Quite significant mitigation involves putting in new pipelines between um, different sewage treatment works in order to take um, uh, areas from um, where there's a massive, where there's um, uh, overloading and taking it into areas where there's where there's less of an issue, and then you get things called integrated wetlands. Um, these are uh, constructed to near to sewage treatment works, and, and our nature-based solutions are fairly popular at the moment in order to help manage phosphates and other chemicals by running them through through a series of interconnected cells, heavily planted with specific wetland vegetation, and they're based on the concept of blending open water ponds and shallow vegetated marshes, so it cleans the water before it goes off off into um, uh, into the network, and we have identified uh, so as part of this. Um, uh, as part of this, we we deal with a lot of these schemes, and uh, this is just one example, which I'll cover really quickly because I know over time. But this is at East Martin, where we identified that um, a proposed um, integrated wetland was going to be constructed right next to the site of a scheduled monument. The scheduled monument is just to the uh, to the north uh, west of the of the canal, which you can see snaking through the through the centre of the of the photograph. 
And when we did the, the field work and looked at the, at the site, we identified that the earthworks actually extended beyond the limit, the scheduling, scheduling and into the area of the, um, of the pro proposed wetlands. So a consultation early with the, with the designers and with the county archaeologist and historic England have ensured that a program of geophysics and uh, topographic survey has been agreed and this will be mitigated through, um, through that. That's it. Really quickly, I'm really sorry, we're past, past time, so if there's any questions. <laughs> yeah.